outfit uh, modeled by Ryan Vitrequa. These are the first traditional Gwich'in outfits made in the Northwest Territories in more than a hundred years. They're the work of 40 Gwich'in seamstresses over the past three and a half years. It's a big day for myself as a Gwich'in, and I'm sure everyone that at home that will see it will be so proud of the product that we, that the Gwich'in had a part in. The outfits are a replica of one made in 1870 that now belongs to the Canadian Museum of Civilization. One was made in each of the four Gwich'in communities in the Mackenzie Delta, with one extra for the museum in Yellowknife, a partner in the project. Seamstresses a hundred years ago used many techniques that Gwich'in women don't use today. It was a lot of work because uh, we had to learn going to training for sewing quills and even the uh, braiding of some of those materials. You know, it was really, it was really hard, uh, frustrating. I like to use that frustrating because it was so much work to put into it. So how did you feel for those boys when they came walking out there? Um, I had a lump in my throat. You know, oh, I feel so good. I feel happy, but it's what we started come to an end, and I feel really good about it. Imagine, the year is 1870. Which end hunters from Peel River are looking for caribou, for food and clothing, five good hides for one summer outfit. If you just think of women sewing, um, you know, during the winter months, let's say in front of a fire. That's exactly what these women do think of as they search at the Smithsonian for traditional Gwich'in clothing three years ago. When I was growing up, I never ever saw or heard of any Gwich'in outfits. Never even seen a picture heard a story or anything of traditional Gwich'in outfits, right? In their hometowns, Aklavik, Tsigechik, Fort McPherson, and Nuvik, not one traditional outfit remains. We got no more in editors who could teach us. The outfit in Washington is from Fort McPherson. It's fascinating, but not what they hoped for. It goes way around like that, and we try to make it that shape, mm -hmm. the way it looks, you know. Um, maybe they used like scrap pieces of mm -hmm. hide, eh? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why that's different color down there too. They didn't have too much hide, mm -hmm. so they were using scrap like pieces piece. here and different pieces down there because they didn't have too much. Mm -hmm. Everything is not gray, eh? Beets. They're looking for porcupine quill decorations that they can duplicate today, an outfit they can copy and take home. And they find it at the Museum of Civilization in Ottawa. This one we think dates to 1870 um, because it came from a Hudson's Bay person. And it was so beautiful and I couldn't believe it. And I, I like it brought me to tears because I was really touched. And, um, and I thought, when I was very young and I was growing up, there was a lot of alcoholism in the Inuvik, well, wherever I was growing up. And, uh, you know, there's low self-esteem and everything that comes along mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, it would have been nice when I was young if I seen this. It would have really helped me to feel good, you know, about uh, our heritage or something, instead of just seeing alcoholism. But the clash of cultures that eroded Gwich'in heritage also helped save some of it. There was, in the 1800s, a great interest from travelers coming through the Mackenzie Valley with Aboriginal items like clothing and snowshoes and other items. And they're the ones who purchased them. And if, if they hadn't purchased them, and if they hadn't ended up in museums today, we just wouldn't be able to see them. Must have been a very fit man. Mm. <laughs> Kept his figures. <laughs> <laughs> Young man. <laughs> well, maybe it's a young man. I always think I always think the neck hole looks rather small to go over somebody's yeah. head. 
Honestly, they have so much patience. I couldn't do that. But Rosie Firth will try. She'll work on an outfit for Fort McPherson. <laughs> there will be four others. When I finish it, I'll tell Shanu Chile next week. They will get 30 caribou hides, scrape them, and bleach them white in the sun. Fresh caribou skin or moose skin, and you clean it with this, scraping it. Even just to get the white hide, to get caribou hide, never mind white hide, just to get caribou hide. From the Gwich'in settlement area, it was very difficult. There's not very many ladies or people who, who work on hides these days. Men will harvest porcupine. I actually plucked them. Did you? Myself, yeah. How did they like it? They didn't, know. <laughs> <laughs> It was, actually, it was actually like plucking a duck. The women will dye the quills and try their hand at a Gwich'in art lost for more than 50 years. My mother used to uh, um, take uh, those blackberries in a dinage, what they call it, and cranberries. She dyed her quill with that. It's good too. It gives nice color. They gather silver willow seeds used as beads on the garment's fringes. To relearn these skills, the Gwich In Social and Cultural Institute drafted some of the best seamstresses in their communities, teaming up with Canadian Heritage and the museum in Yellowknife. And we're really working with the last set of elders that lived on the land. So this knowledge won't be there here for very long, much longer. So there's a great urgent need to do this work now before it's lost forever. Sometimes we sew and we just, we just uh, cut it with our teeth too. Huh? And now sometimes I forget I have no teeth. I just put cinnamon tea. I can. I just forget <laughs> I have no teeth. <laughs> we use our teeth uh, and our mouth to sew that quilt. So we practiced how to prepare quills mm. by sticking it in our mouth and making it soft and pliable, and then how to stitch it on. The women work with porcupine quills at workshops in five communities. And then, then we have to put it in the, to soak it, and then we flatten it out. There's air inside of each one of the little quills, so we take that out. But it's even better to uh, put it in your mouth because it's, it's natural. The patterns are cut and the outfits take shape over months and months of work. Are they as good as the original? It looks simple. Sure, it's simple, but when you see it, I mean, in the pictures, you think, oh, you just have to do this and do that, but it's not so. My stitches are showing, whereas that outfit, you can't see a stitch. Oh my God, is that what you're going to... Mm, this is a new one? No. <laughs> 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 you see those <laughs> They soon find they'll have to use beads for some of the decoration. We estimated if we, if we did it, with all quill work on that outfit, it would have took three and a half years for one outfit. Now it's time for the finishing touches on the very last outfit, marking the end of four and a half years of work. Going to leave a hole in your life when it's finished? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's actually, you know what? It probably would fill up a little bit of a hole that was in my life. So the final Gwich'in outfit is ready for the unveiling and celebration at the museum in Yellowknife, and it will remain there. The others will be returned to Gwich'in communities, but there's more to the project's legacy. It brought chills right through my body. Just knowing that I'm going to recreate history from a hundred years ago and learn the old skills of the old ways. And I'm honored to be here. In Yellowknife, 
I'm Lee Selleck.